the focus of my presentation will really be how uh, agency in the museum space can be uh, understood and in some sense reconceptualized when we consider uh, the role of uh, uh, the neurocognitive mechanisms that are behind uh, agency, what we know about it. And um, I will uh, make also a brief case for an approach that could sound uh, disturbing to some, but I think it's extremely important to consider in its implications that is what I could call a, a biomuseology approach. So what happens when we consider that our visitors are not simply minds, but they are biological beings with a much more complex functioning than the whole, only the mind. So first of all, what the, the starting point is this. Um, from a neurobiological point of view, humans have two different modes of functioning. Uh, and uh, this is related to one aspect that is becoming uh, extremely prominent in today's uh, cognitive neuroscience, that is the idea of the predictive brain. So uh, basically, uh, our brain has not evolved to think. Our brain has evolved to keep us alive, which is uh, very complex, very challenging. And as a consequence of this, most of the uh, bandwidth of our brain is basically devoted to biological regulation, which is uh, an extremely challenging task for the simple reason that uh, interacting with an environment means having to cope with uh, a lot of unforeseen circumstances. We are uh, constantly in a state in which uh, uh, the, even the most uh, simple action plans can be disrupted. But we have to understand that even for, uh, to uh, carry out even the slightest task like, for example, raising this end, uh, our brain has to uh, design this action in advance, recruit resources, and regulate how these resources interfere with the whole bodily budget of uh, metabolic uh, resources. So this means literally what kind of fuel do we use, what kind of circuits will be uh, um, employed for this, uh, what kind of competing tasks should be in in inhibited for this, and so on and so forth. What is the consequence? The consequence is that uh, uh, our brains strive for minimizing predictive surprise. What does this mean? It means that most of the time, the optimal environment for us is a situation in which we are completely under control. We control everything. And by controlling everything, our brain can navigate our cruise speed and uh, in some sense basically uh, provide what is needed in every possible uh, circumstance which uh, is uh, basically anticipated successfully. However, the capacity of our brain to do this is also related to the predictive capacity of the brain itself. So how do we, uh, let's say, represent our environment? How do we code our environment? Um, to do this properly, especially since uh, human environments are extremely variable. We have basically occupied the most <laughs> ecological niches on the planet. So we really have to cope with very, very different environmental uh, context. We need also to simulate possible uh, alternative realities. So the capacity to simulate these realities is fundamental to hone the predictive capacity of our brain. And this reflects in a structuring that has become so commonplace for us that we don't even uh, question uh, it uh, anymore, which is basically the distinction between weekly time and festive time. What do we do in weekly time? We create, culturally speaking, an environment that is as predictable as possible. What kind of cultural frameworks we do, do we use in uh, weekly time? Social norms, conventions, language, everything that can literally reduce the uncertainty about what other people are doing, what are we doing in a specific context, because in this particular context, that of weekly time, that is generally also our professional context, we understand that errors are very costly. So minimizing surprise is fundamental. But this is not enough. Uh, if this was all there were, uh, basically, we would be unable to cope with uh, 
changes in the environment because we would be accustomed to a situation in which everything is predictable. So we have created another mental and uh, biophysical space that we call uh, festive time in which we do exactly the opposite. We venture into experiences that systematically surprise our brains. This is indispensable because by doing this, our brain learns how to adapt to completely different uh, cognitive scenarios. And uh, this is basically the role of culture as we mean it in most contexts. So not necessarily only social anthropological culture, but literally all the forms of culture that we are interested in since we are sitting in this room, which have to do, of course, with uh, visual arts, performing arts, uh, heritage, whatever, whatever you can imagine that we tend to uh, associate to an idea of culture as creative expression. Okay. Uh, the point is that uh, to uh, really profit from uh, the cognitive advantage of this kind of experience, we have developed uh, an, a, an approach that biophysically speaking is uh, inextricably related to movement. So for humans, cognition is basically related to movement because uh, uh, the paradigm in which we have uh, developed these skills was a paradigm in which we were constantly moving. So it's extremely important to understand that an approach to cognition in which movement is inhibited is an approach that to some extent is critical for us that uh, requires a reprogramming of a very natural and embedded biocognitive mechanisms. And I will uh, briefly uh, review some of them uh, in a minute. So in particular, when we consider the museum display from this point of view, we have to understand that uh, if we imagine, I mean, Outside of the, of course, all the paraphernalia that we use, of course, also to legitimize museum practices. But uh, if we basically conceive the museum display as a platform for unidirectional knowledge flows, in which uh, the possibility of move of uh, cognition through movement is inhibited to a serious extent, we are in some sense uh, missing the target to a large extent in terms of what we can really uh, achieve with the museum experience given how humans have been biologically designed. In addition to this, we know and we are perfectly aware of the fact that the museum display by definition proposes a specific cognitive and emotional programming in the way in which, of course, the museum display organizes and offers, for example, a certain type of uh, narrative, uh, mental model, and so on and so forth. So this said, we have to understand what are these mechanisms and how they relate to our capacity to, in some sense, renegotiate the sense of agency, keeping into account what we are learning about how humans uh, basically uh, experience um, situations that are cognitively stimulating like the ones of which the museum is a typical example. The first point is what is called active inference. The predictive brain basically uh, uh, mandates that we explore the environment through thought experiences, th so, sorry, thought experiments all the time. The best way to learn is literally by provoking incidents that uh, reveal us something different. Think of children. What do children do when they start learning and developing a model of the world? They try to do everything that they can to break the rules. This is literally mandated by the, the, the inference engine of their brain. The only way to really understand how the world works is to break the rule all the time and to understand what is the consequence of breaking these rules. So active inference, first of all, is a situation in which we are in the most productive learning mode insofar as we have an environment that is literally an experimental playground. If this is not the case, we are not learning well. Second point, the so-called extended mind. We tend to think that all the mental processes that uh, are uh, characterizing us are within our brain. 
This is absolutely not correct. Think, for example, of something like your, for example, your note pad, literally. If you are, you are writing with a pen on paper, what is this? For example, it's an externalization of memory. If we understand, for example, the kind of use that we make, for example, of our cell phones to navigate and acquire information, we understand that to an increasing degree today, for example, our mental processes in terms of uh, information processing and in terms of browsing are externalized. So, and by the way, of course, depend on the algorithms that guide this kind of search that are not the mental algorithms in our brain, okay? So this means that the extended mind literally as a paradigm that is today prevailing in, the, in, the, in cognitive neuroscience is the idea that objects around us are part of our mental processes. So the museum space is not outside our mind. The museum space is a part of our mind. If you combine the perspective of the active inference and of the extended mind, you literally understand that embedding people in a museum environment literally means that you are driving a certain way to think that is not simply to think about the museum display, but to integrate this with the emotional and cognitive processes of the people, of every single person in a different way. Third aspect. The, as I said, the uh, movement is extremely important. This is the so-called inactivist perspective, which means that since we experiment with things, situations in which we cannot manipulate objects are situations in which we are inhibiting most of our learning routines. So what is the consequence of this? Of course, in the museum, we cannot manipulate objects, but we have to create a situation in which this manipulation can be made in ways that are coordinated to the museum experience. In the moment in, in which you understand how to do this, the way in which people can make sense of the museum experiences skyrockets in, in, the, in terms of their capacity to create a more agentic, more active perspective of their museum experience. In this particular sense, the role of the digital is paramount. It's one of the reasons why the digital is so important. The digital must become the inactive playground of the physical experience. If we are not able to, to couple these two dimensions, we are again jeopardizing most of what we can get from the museum experience in terms of our uh, biological design. The other aspect is what is called today uh, the dimension of um, constructed emotion. We have uh, thought for a long time that emotions are a natural condition of humans and for example that there are basic fundamental emotions that are the same for everybody. We are quickly understanding that this is not the case. Emotions are basically driven by how we describe them and how we represent them internally which means that, for example, different languages with different words command different emotions. This is one of the reasons why, for example, a multilinguistic perspective or people who are bilingual, trilingual, are basically uh, recruiting a repertoire of emotions that is much richer than people who are, uh, of course, monolingual for the simple reason that, uh, of course, the tools that they have to represent and to enact emotions are very different. So what is the consequence of this? The consequence is that we have to understand what kind of emotional programming we enact with a specific kind of museum display. And this is far from neutral, as you can understand. So, and I'm quickly going to the, to, to the, to the conclusion. This, uh, the, 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 the last element that is extremely important from this point of view is how this reflects into the sense of self. The sense of self that we have is a, a constant negotiation between an integration of uh, internal bodily signals and external signals that have to do with our interaction with the environment. Our sense of agency is basically the balance between these two dimensions. So the fact that we think that we are encouraged to act in certain circumstances or not, basically depends on the structure on the of the environment to which we are exposed. So literally, our museums are uh, contributing to the evolution of our sense of self and how this sense of self reflects or not reflects into agency. 
In the moment in which we start to think of why so many people are intimidated by museums or people who are not really able to get from museums the kind of experience that we wished for, we probably have to understand that this has to do with the fact that we are systematically ignoring 95% of the complexity that I'm uh, uh, just uh, uh, mentioning to you in this particular circumstance. So how can we get some more insight into this. We need to learn to read the biofeedback dynamics that is related to the museum experience. Eye movements, skin conductance, all aspects that we tend to think, are, oh no, no, these things are really like a sort of big brother kind of monitoring of what people do, uh, is something that we don't want to see in our museums. But the point is, that in the moment in which we ignore this wealth of feedback that our body gives of the museum experience, we are literally simply taking as a default the uh, emotional and cognitive programming that we are defining with our museum display and simply letting it be, which means that if we want, for example, to represent a certain type of reality in a certain way that is, of course, ideologically charged, that is, of course, uh, culturally charged, for, for example, also in terms of, uh, as I said, selectively inhibiting certain types of behavioral responses. For example, I understand I am provocative, but the fact that we cannot dance in our museums, the fact that people cannot move in a synchronized way when they, they interact with the display is a serious inhibition. So, of course, we have good reasons not to do this, but why not considering possibilities of recruiting our uh, embodied cognition in ways that are probably much more generative from the point of view of the response that people can give. If we want to do this, we literally need to understand the biological signals that are constantly produced when we engage in museum experiences. So from this point of view, an idea of uh, biomuseology in which we start to integrate this kind of signals is probably uh, less uh, exotic than one can think. Also because the idea is not a top-down conditioning of people. So getting these signals to, let's say, for example, design the museum in ways that makes it more appealing as a sort of, let's say, translation of neuromarketing. That's not what I have in mind at all. What I'm thinking of is the possibility to offer to the same visitors a deeper insight of how they react, how they respond to certain types of displays and museums experiences to, let's say, make them more aware of the possibilities of the potential of the museum visit. And this, by the way, uh, builds on two very important building blocks of um, pedagogy, not necessarily only museum pedagogy. One is John Dewey, because of course, this kind of perspective, especially when this perspective is socialized, when we understand that this adjunctive perspective is at full potential, when we consider how people synchronize and how people socially interact within the museum space. And the second one is, of course, Paulo Freire, is the conscientization of the experience. You understand what are the constraints through which you access this kind of experience. So I understand that this is a, let's say, big leap, but also at the same time, uh, one of the really interesting reasons why we had the digital today is exactly this. If we think that the digital is simply about a better marketing or offering people some more experience, let's say, uh, in a non-physical space, we are probably not even scratching the surface. And we don't have to time, the time to elaborate on this. But the real reason why, by the way, digital technologies have developed has been a response exactly to this kind of social demands. Because the development of the digital basically, I mean, is a long-term consequence of the countercultural revolution of the 70s. So this really means that uh, for museums that want to take this seriously, a biomuseological approach can really be a game changer. This is at least my, my, my humble opinion. Thank you very much.